My name is Karl Voigt. I'm here to speak to you, um, to motivate you, to in make sure that software you're going to use or software you're going to produce is under a free license because there are a certain amount of positive aspects many people don't know of. Uh, and I tried to um, come up with some slides that cover a part of those arguments in order to make sure that you know what are the advantages and what are the downsides of open source software in contrast to closed or proprietary software. Okay, this is the goal for today uh, and this is what I'm speaking to you. Uh, I'm not something, I don't know, very special uh, to this topic. I'm just a normal computer user, like most of you are. Uh, I have uh, some open source projects for myself as well, going public, or who, uh, that went public. Uh, no, no, big, no big project, just small, usual personal information management projects. So if you're interested in my personal open source projects, you can visit my GitHub page and then you'll find for roughly 60 repositories, mostly neat things for personal information management. Or you can watch uh, the uh, video from last year from the Grazer Linux Tage where I explained a couple of those projects and how to use them and how you can profit uh, yourself when working with your local file system. Okay, so this is not an exhaustive uh, look on the free software topic. It's just some input uh, I'd want to like to give to you in order that you are able to judge well whether or not the free software is worth trying for a specific purpose or not. Yeah. When I'm talking about free software, free and open software, uh, of course it needs some definition. This is not about the definition because uh, the, the, you can look it up yourself. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page here, that free is not as in free beer, but as in freedom. That's very, very important thing to understand. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's for free in terms of money, uh, but you are always able to look at the source code, modify the source code and so forth. So this is very important. Uh, and when we are talking about free as in freedom, of course you have to pay for it. Probably not with money, but most, uh, most probably with your time. So you gain more knowledge or you have to uh, accumulate more knowledge in order to use free software. But this is a good thing to have, because then you are empowered to do more than you could before. Uh, and, of course, it's being paid by the guys and the, the girls who are doing the programming. So they do it for free most of the time. Uh, and therefore, you are the ones who are profiting from their work. And this is very, very important to keep in mind. So, why should we all care about free and open source software? That's a very important question to ask. Uh, and I would like to start with an example, an example from the real world, which is always difficult when you compare something from the digital world to the real world, but uh, bear with me, I'll, I'll try to come up with a good example. Imagine yourself, you buy, you're buying a car, an automobile, a vehicle. Would you buy a car where you cannot access the engine compartment yourself? Would you do that? I wouldn't do that. Not because I am a mechanic and I want to open the motor compartment and fix things myself, but I want to have the freedom to choose whoever uh, is able to look at my engine when something breaks down or something is wrong, something has to be fixed or checked. I want to make sure that some competent other guy is able to open my, uh, my car and take a look at the engine, and if I'm not happy with that person or that service, I am free to change to a different service station. This is very important to me. So, because most of the time people say, I don't care if it's open source or not, because I'm not a coder, I'm not a programmer. This is actually not true, because you really do care, because you, open source software makes sure that not you are able to read it, but everybody else as well especially when it uh, comes to uh, checks for security, uh, when it comes to finding bugs and so forth, but we come to that later on. So, being able to 
open a source code of a software is not something which is only related to you as a user, but to everybody using the software and to fixing problems, finding problems, uh, checking the quality and whatnot. Another example I like to give here, uh, who of you have heard of Microsoft OneNote? Okay, whoa, lots of people. I love Microsoft OneNote, I really do. Microsoft OneNote is probably the most, or the, the coolest product from, from Microsoft besides Excel, in my opinion. I wouldn't touch it. I would not put energy in it. I would not put data in it. And I have said so right from the start when they came out with it. For one single reason, they're not open source and additionally, they have a proprietary file format. And the thing I said, I don't know, eight, nine years ago when they started with OneNote, please don't use it. Use something else which makes sure that you are able to access your data and you use your features and so forth later on when something happens to Microsoft or the product. And yes, uh, this is a blog post from all, uh, April last year, so it's one year ago, uh, where Microsoft announced that they are discontinuing OneNote from the Office version in favor to OneNote in the Windows 10 version. Well, this might not seem to be very severe because, yeah, we just switch version, but you have to bear in mind uh, the Windows 10 version is a stripped down version. It doesn't feature all the features of the big version. It has a different file format and it forced the users converting their data to the Microsoft Azure cloud. So you were forced, when you were a user of uh, OneNote, you were forced not only to uh, not use uh, lots of features from the desktop version anymore because they have been gone. Uh, you have been forced to move your data to the public cloud where you don't have any clue what happens to your data because it's not on your, in your control anymore. Uh, and of course you have the hassle of migrating, finding out what's working, what's not, and because of missing features, uh, some data might not be uh, migrated at all because, for example, in the early version, there, for example, were no tags in the Windows 10 version. So you probably were losing or not being able to use whatever, I didn't check it myself, all of your tags. So if you are a frequent tagger of your uh, OneNote pages, uh, then you'd lost that feature. And this is something to bear in mind. Because it's not only uh, one note, uh, one example I took here, there are hundreds of products out there which cause a certain uh, lock-in effect, a vendor lock-in effect. So you are committed to a given feature set of a proprietary software, you, you love those, uh, and, you, and if, for example, you are using the Apple universe, you probably might like very much uh, products like uh, iPhoto, but iPhoto is discontinued meanwhile. Uh, I think it's discontinued. Uh, but those were all nice and really, really cool products with really cool features. But um, the thing with uh, iPhoto, because I took a closer look myself 10 years ago, something like that, so my knowledge is not up to date on the, on the Apple platform. But back then, uh, iPhoto was uh, using proprietary internal uh, format for your photos. So if you um, upload your digital photographs from your digital camera to iPhoto, you had all kinds of features and the, the, the UI was beautiful and you could uh, do some sets for given events and so forth. So really, really nice software. But bear in mind, five years later probably, you'd like to change or switch your platform to uh, Windows or Linux any platform where iPhoto is not available. Then you would probably start thinking, okay, what about my photographs? I have thousands of private photographs in iPhoto. I have tagged them, I have worked on them, I have modified them, I have uh, added meta information, who's on those photographs, I have added, uh, uh, I've cut them and so forth. Uh, and then probably you were one of the poor guys 
who found out that this information is not stored in the photos itself, but in a proprietary database, and the photographs were named with randomly looking file names in one big folder. How to move away from such a system to another system? It's almost impossible, except somebody took its time and found out how Apple was doing it. It's called reverse engineering and provide you a feature to um, convert from the proprietary uh, Apple uh, format to a, a different format. And then it's a question whether or not this is the format you're looking for, for your next version. So before you're using or start using a software, you, sh you have to make sure that uh, the file format is an open one, and when it's free software, the file format is always an open one, and most of the time uh, they follow good open standards for that. Okay? So even though iPhoto or, for example, Picasa, Google Picasa was another example for that, a uh, cool program, uh, they didn't explain how to do it, they used some internal format for modification of photographs, metadata, blah, 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 and therefore there were issues when somebody was moving away from their solution to a different one. And when people did not think of this situation before, they simply lost data. They, they lost five years of photographs or something like that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And make sure you have a good big backup. <laughs> people lose uh, photographs not only because of that, but also because of losing data altogether. Another thing uh, which I tend to use as an example between proprietary software and open or free software is uh, uh, playing with uh, Playmobil toys and playing with some Lego bricks. Uh, when you have Playmobil, or I don't know if this is Playmobil, uh, but this thing always stays a uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever this is. It will never be something different. You bought this, it's there, it's working, it's looking beautifully, but it will never be something different. So if your requirements change, and probably you need not a, a, a tar Tyrannosaurus, but something else, a giraffe or whatever, an elephant, this will never be uh, your tool again. In contrast to that, if you have something made of Lego bricks, and this is the State of Liberty of New York, you can tear it apart, use the parts of the software, the toy, and create something new, which suits your requirements that always change over time. So your current set of requirements are fine now, probably, but they're not fine one, five, ten years from now because your life changes, your situation changes, your requirement changes. Bear in mind, change is the only thing that is constant, therefore make sure that you have flexible tools with open forwards. And therefore, uh, I'd like to go through that list with some uh, attributes that are usually associated with proprietary software on the left-hand side, or closed-source software, and uh, open source software. Just to give you some examples, what might be the implications, of course this is not true for 100% of the cases, but this is a general uh, approach in order to classify the differences. When you have something that is of, made of closed software, um, this may be read, the source code of it may be read by only a few companies usually. They have to sign an NDA agreement and therefore they are not able to talk to anybody about their findings when they view the source. So for example, lots of companies do have the source code of Microsoft Windows or Word or something like that. But you have to have a decent size in order to be able to discuss this issue with big companies like Microsoft. And if you took a closer look at the source code, you're not able or allowed to talk to anybody about your findings. This is a bad situation because with open source software, anybody who's interested may read the source code. And, of course, the source is always freely available and you can talk to everybody, discuss some issues, some findings, and so forth. Uh, closed software, therefore, can't be checked on quality, security, or bugs. Because even though you are in a big company who is allowed to take a closer look on it, 
you're not uh, in the position of making any improvements or talk to somebody, discuss inf information and so forth. Uh, with open source software, anybody may check any aspect of the source code. So if you, for example, you're a researcher and you're in interested in uh, how other programmers are naming v variables or how these namings has an impact on the security of the software or the any other uh, aspect, you're free to, to choose uh, any open source project and there you go. Here is all the information. Do your research with it. F have some findings. And those findings are pretty good for the programmers because they learn from your findings. This is not possible with closed source software. Uh, when a company decides to discontinue a product or a company is discontinued somehow, then all of their proprietary software are dead. You don't get any more uh, security bug fixes, you don't get any updates, uh, nobody tells you uh, how it's done. When it's uh, somehow cloud-based, it's dead within seconds. Uh, if you don't have something which runs locally, uh, if, if there is a licensed server in the cloud and you have it installed locally, it's dead as well. So software is dead when the company or the product is discontinued and you are all 100% depending on the software vendor. This is the lock-in effect I was talking about. With open source software, you have all kinds of possibilities. Uh, so because of you've got the source code of this software and the project went down somehow, probably it was a one-man show and something happened to this one-man show, he lost interest or won the lottery or whatnot, then uh, you are able to maintain your source code yourself. You are able to hire a company to maintain the source code. Or you can uh, take part of a new community who does a fork of this software and maintains a new version of it. And it happens all the time. There are so many forks out there. For example, <coughs> probably the most uh, public, uh, publicly known fork was when OpenOffice forked to OpenOffice and LibreOffice. Of course, meanwhile, OpenOffice is only maintained by the company IBM and they use it internally. They don't uh, give um, updates that often, new features doesn't get published that often, so it's better to choose LibreOffice. And you have the freedom to choose whether or not keep uh, yourself on the OpenOffice fork or on the LibreOffice fork. It's up to you. So with Open source software products, uh, you're always free to choose. Uh, you have more uh, or you have options when the thing is discontinued somehow. With closed so source software, you have to start from scratch. And hopefully, you are able to migrate your proper data format, which is sometimes the worst part of it. <clears throat> And yeah, uh, if, for example, Microsoft is telling you that their file format is open, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> they have open standards for the file format, that's true, but this open standard doesn't have anything to do with the file format you have on your local hard disk, because there was one situation when they did the, the, the open standard, and then they added some other features, and they didn't update the, the standard. Oh, yes, and one thing I forgot, with the discontinuation of um, OneNote. OneNote file format was once documented in 2010 and never got an update. So everything that happened between 2010 and last year is unknown if you want to work with the file format of OneNote. One aspect I forgot at the previous slide. Users can only do what the vendor allows. If there is a feature for something, a button, a menu entry, you can do that. But most of the time, you cannot do anything other than that. So if you are a perfectly good user of Microsoft Word, for example, and I'm sorry for the company Microsoft that I'm using their examples all the time, this holds true for all the companies that are providing you a proprietary, source, uh, proprietary software. If you are a very advanced user of Word, uh, you cannot do anything more than the features that are provided you uh, on the ribbons or in the menus and so forth. 
with one single exception. If there's something like a visual basic for application, you maybe start programming, but if something is not accessible uh, via VBA functions, you cannot do this as well. With open source, users might find new creative use cases. I have some slides later on to explain this, this issue more. And this is a very interesting uh, thing for me because I've read so many uh, statements from open source uh, uh, producers of open source uh, and they said that it's, it's very interesting how they find, find out how their users are using their software. They never imagined how their software could be used uh, before they've seen some creative uh, people out there misusing their software. There's no misuse of software. If it's working and it's, it's uh, uh, working fine with their use case, do it. You're free to do so. Yeah, the proprietary file formats I already mentioned a couple of times. So, so you might lock your data in in some proprietary file formats. There is, of course, closed software, source software which is using open standards. Uh, yeah, it depends how uh, good they follow the open standards for the file formats. And uh, with free software, file formats cannot be proprietary because you can always look it up in the source code how the uh, resulting data is written. That's very important. So open source is a guarantee, more or less, for readable files, readable data. Nobody is able to reuse parts of a proprietary software. So, for example, with open source, uh, and if you are a coder or part of some open source project, you might, uh, you might reuse any part of any other project you can find. So if you find, for example, that some uh, visualization engine of a software product is a good one, and you could need that in your product as well, feel free to take it. If the licenses are compatible enough, so there are some differences in open source licenses, of course. But if this is not an issue, and most of the time it hopefully is not, then you're free to use charge. Uh, you're free to use any uh, parts of the other software in your project. Oh yeah, if you're using closed software, you are investing in money, only in money, because. In my opinion, the knowledge is not that important or not that relevant because uh, I started using modern IT technology in the early 90s. I started using open source software in mid 90s. Yeah, in mid 90s. The knowledge I learned in mid 90s of open source software, Linux, shell, bash, uh, shell scripting, and so forth, uh, is still valid to, I don't know, 98%, something like that. So almost everything is still valid today. And now, imagine back then, in the early 90s, what I learned about Microsoft Windows or DOS uh, or uh, whatever you name it, uh, OS 2 from IBM and so forth, it's gone. Because with Windows, they changed it over time. With each major release, they changed things. And meanwhile, this old knowledge doesn't relate anymore to the thing which is installed on my business notebook, which of, co of course runs with Windows 10. But I had to relearn it. Actually, with my current job, I first was uh, uh, introduced to Windows 10. And there were some really basic things I had to learn from scratch. So most, or not most, Oh, probably most knowledge I learned about uh, proprietary software in the 90s is not of any value anymore. Therefore, in my opinion, closed source software is only an investment in money. You ship your money to usually some California company, so you're not supporting your local companies but some other countries. And open source software is an investment in in knowledge and in long-term knowledge. Because, for example, LaTeX, LaTeX knowledge still works. The things I learned right from the start when I began to using these uh, tools, it's still valid. With closed source software, you only invest in short-term knowledge. And when there is a new release, a new major release, boom. Certain things you have to learn from scratch. 
in my opinion, this is the biggest reason for myself not to use or to minimize the use of closed source software because I'm too lazy to learn new things meanwhile when I know that on the, on the other side things are working fine with, me or with my old knowledge and I could use the same time to learn new knowledge for the open source in order to get better and not to learn something in order to be able to do the same. Big difference. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I have a couple of slides with some different angle of views depending on in which, which situation you are. Just some keywords in order to make sure that we are on the same page here. So this is the angle of view for companies selecting a software for use. So not for producing, for coding, but for using. So each and every company relies on external software in order to run their business. May it's some email clients, uh, some business services, web server, whatever. Uh, and uh, only few open licenses permit commercial uses. There are some out there which permit commercial uses, but the vast majority of open source projects, they are happy that you are using the open source software for commercial purposes. That's very important. Uh, and there are some examples, uh, advantages in uh, an open source software when it comes to some business features like rolling out the software and so forth. Do I have to switch microphone? Okay, probably better. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. <clears throat> there are some advantages in, in rolling out software and doing license management. So I have been in the fortune or maybe Perfect. So, there are some ad uh, advantages uh, for companies when using uh, software with software rollout. So, actually providing the software to the employees, being able to roll it out on each and every company notebook, for example. Uh, I've been in the lucky or not so lucky position to manage IT departments for several companies and I can tell you with proprietary software it's always a hassle because you have to Keep in mind that you need to maintain not all, only the software itself, but the according license for it. And you have to make sure that you're not overusing the software when it comes to the number of licenses bought and so forth. If you have a, a, a software which is um, being free to install as many times as you want and we, where you have a general key, you uh, uh, additionally have to make sure that you have to report the correct numbers for that software and so forth. With open source software, you can install any standard software you might find necessary for your employees and each and every notebook or computer for your employees. No hassle with that, no licensing issues whatsoever. Uh, community support, there is a slide on that. Uh, so I think it's an, an advantage when you don't have uh, uh, commercial support, but you have a strong community which is able to support you. No vendor login, we've dealt with that already. And customization is possible. So if your business is having issues with the software being used, then you are able to do customizations yourself if you have the capacity. And many companies, especially the ones that are IT-based, they have programmers and they are able to add a minimal feature set which is very helpful for your business to the software which is used. And that's very important. Uh, this is also for an uh, angle of view of a company, but now for developing, for providing code, for creating code. So for example, uh, most of the time you hear the argument, okay, when I switch to an open source license model, I have to give up all the control. That's true, you have less control over what's happening to your software when you switch to a, uh, a li an open license. But bear in mind, there are some advantages as well. For example, you are potentially, if you do it right, you're potentially gaining a user community. So when people are able to modify code, to take a look at it, and to, to reuse parts of it and so forth, then a community usually happens around your software, around your software project, and people are helping each other. 
So you're not in the position of helping 100% of your customers, but the, the customers or the users are helping each other. When you have a savvy, a tech savvy colleague, uh, he's able to provide me some, uh, some kind of support for open source projects. But for example, if my word is not doing what I want to do, my colleague is in the same position as I am. For example, <laughs> currently in the company, since a year, I have the issue that everything I type in Microsoft Word is always in Times New Roman. <laughs> Nobody is able to help me. <laughs> I tried, really. Okay. Development community. So not only the user community, but also some kind of developer community. So people who are actually adding functionality to your source code, to your software. So you're the company providing software and other people add functionality to your software project. Which means that uh, they actually helping your business as well because you're commercial customers. You can sell the software as well. It's still open source. Uh, there, it's okay for a couple of licensing models, uh, then they get the functionality as well. So bear in mind that the development community, com uh, community is an awesome, awesome thing to have. So it's something which is really, really a huge positive aspect for open source software. And of course, they support you in finding bugs. So you're not the only one who has to find uh, issues with your, with your software. They provide you with external security checks. So if some security researcher in Australia is working on your software with a group of students and they find some issues with your software, which may potentially lead to security risks, they are able to tell you so, so that you are able to fix it or they even provide a fix themselves. That's a very, very lucky case to have. And, of course, all kinds of feedbacks. User feedback, usability feedbacks, that's always cool. Choosing a license.
Aspekte an der Software sind mir wichtig. Äh, kommerzielle äh, Benutzung erlaubt oder nicht erlaubt, äh, Modifizierungen sind erlaubt oder, oder die Veröffentlichung von Modifizierungen sind mandatory oder nicht und solche Sachen. Da kann man sich quasi sein Wunschmodell zusammenklicken. Es gibt äh, sehr, eine große Varianz von, von Lizenzen. Die bekanntesten sind natürlich die GPL-Lizenzen, aber nicht nur. MIT ist sehr freundlich für kommerziellen Use und so weiter. Da kann man sich die passende Lizenz aussuchen. Also, okay, we are live already with this microphone. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so choosing a license, choosealicense.com is a very good way of finding the appropriate, uh, not the appropriate, <laughs> the appropriate license for your project in order to make sure that you are able to define what can be done What is the level of freedom? Angle of view. So now we have a different slide on the angle of view. This time, user selecting a software to use. So you're not necessarily have to be a programmer to do so. Uh, but this is a slide that summarizes some arguments for an ordinary user uh, like you or your family members and so forth for using open size uh, modeled uh, software. Uh, so. Free and open source software license is no guarantee uh, that a project is a good one. So, I, I don't know, 99.9 .9 of all open source projects out there are crap. They are crap because most of them are one-man shows, not maintained anymore, somebody lost uh, interest in it, there is no community, and so forth. But on the other hand side, the big uh, uh, open source project like Firefox, Linux, um, uh, Progress SQL and so, SQL and so forth, so databases, uh, web servers, they are large, they are well known, they have huge communities, they are well maintained, you get features, all, new features all the time, you get bug fixes all the time, they are actively uh, working together with their communities, so these are the projects you have to use. Uh, so Free and open source software is no guarantee that something is good, secure, high quality, whatever. But it's an important thing uh, to have. So therefore, most open source projects are no option for you. Because of one man show or no person show and no, pe no peer checks on security, quality and so forth. Another angle of view which involves everybody at least uh, give him a certain age, is the view of taxpayers. In my personal opinion, here lies uh, huge advantages which are not yet in place. So you're paying tax. You're paying tax for your local communities. You're paying tax for your region. You're paying tax for the country. And this tax money is then used to uh, give it to software producing companies in order to produce software to uh, organize the, the city, the region, the state, in order to organize data and so forth. And now, of course, uh, all different kinds of organizations uh, using all different other software, proprietary software, to do the same things. Because everybody basically has the same requirements. All of them have to organize their employees, all of them have to um, distribute email and so forth. And now we are, we are paying multiple times the same money for uh, yet another copy of the same thing. On the other hand side, there would be a large pool of already open source software which could be used for the same purpose. So everybody is investing in knowledge or in investing new features or better quality, better security, instead of just putting the same thing again in some different organization. It would be also an investment in the local communities, in the lo local companies for support for providing new features and not uh, some US-based multinationals which are doing uh, millions and billions already. Expert demand is more uh, uh, experts demand already more independence from those multinationals on all levels. Uh, for example, on EU level, they tell that we are much uh, 
uh, we are in a bad vendor lock-in situation because many, many uh, uh, software is not, um, I don't know the English term, Ausschreibung, who, who's not the English term? They, they don't announce it uh, publicly you know, and before they choose a vendor, they just buy from Microsoft. Nobody gets fired for buying Microsoft, for example, for Office products. But there are, there are some new uh, movements there. For example, in, 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 in France, they are uh, invest heavily investing in LibreOffice, for example, or in Italy, the military, for example. Uh, and there is a very cool project I highly recommend to support. It's called uh, uh, publiccode.eu, and their slogan is public money, public code. So if the public pays for something, the end result has to be accessible and usable for the public. And uh, their main points are tax savings, collaboration among all the different organizations, serving the public, fostering innovation, which is very important because billions of euros are going straight down to the trash bin because of we don't know, uh, we don't follow this strategy. This is very important because it's our money being wasted all the time, big time. So, another thing you have to keep in mind is the level of maturity. The thing I was telling you before, not every open source software is worth using. This is, these are some aspects you have to keep in mind in order to judge whether or not an open source project is worth using or introducing to your company or something like that. It's of course security, it's the stability, so it shouldn't break down all the time and pro potentially losing data. It has to have a certain community, not only developer community, but also a community of users. Because then you get a much better support, in my opinion. Uh, the documentation is a very good sign that the project has some level of maturity. When you have a document which is up to date and which explains how the software is working, when you're not able to read or you're not willing to read the source code. That's very important, documentation. Update policies. How do they guarantee that your data isn't lost because of some migration path and you're using old and new software and they're not compatible anymore and so forth? Future proofness, the same aspect. And how do they handle incompatible changes? So when there is a new major release and the file format, for example, is, is, cha uh, is changed to a new one, how do they provide you help in the migration path? Backwards, forwards, whatever. These are very interesting uh, arguments for open source software or the for judging the level of maturity, not only for open source software, but also for closed source software. You cannot tell anything about security because nobody is able to look at it. Which brings us to the next slide. If you happen to be in the keynote, in the German keynote before, uh, Max from uh, Free Software Foundation Europe had a couple of slides uh, which dealt especially with the aspect of security in open source software. If it's not open, nobody can tell whether or not it's secure because the vendor can tell you A and the software is able to do B and nobody could judge that this is different. So if there is a high need or high demand for security, openness of the source code is a must-have. Not an option, a must-have. Because in a closed source software, the code can do whatever the code wants, independent what the company tells you, what it should do, or m many times they don't even have an idea that they have some sort of uh, security bugs and so forth. So it needs to be open. Another thing here, support. Uh, raise your hand if you have uh, experience with uh, support of proprietary or closed source software. Keep your hands up when this was satisfaction. Okay, no, no hand up. Okay, so this resembles also my personal experience. Whenever I contact a, co uh, a support for software, I put money in. Most of the time, I was not very happy with the support I was getting, although I paid for it. On the other hand side, most of the questions I have asked to some sort of uh, mature community was handled very well. 
I found my answers, I found the, 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 the solution for my problems. And this is a very important aspect because people tend to choose proprietary software because, oh, because for open source, I don't get support. Mm. Okay, the next one, code quality. Uh, when a company is asked whether or not they want to open source their project, they are reluctant to do so because they pr know perfectly well how in bad shape their software code is which is an alarming sign, because on the other hand side, with open source software, everybody knows that this software is going to be public on GitHub or whatnot. And therefore, the programmers make sure that the source code is clean, easy to read. No source code project is able to scale when the source code is not clean. Bear that in mind, because proprietary software may be of very, very bad quality. Which brings us to the next thing. This is an image of the first computer bug, which was found in the, I don't know, 60s, something like that. Uh, it was an actual bug, and therefore we say it's a bug when you've got an issue with software. With closed source software, bugs usually are seen as a burden. It's something that prevents me of producing new features. It's something that doesn't help me gain new customers. It's something I have to invest money in, which doesn't bring any, any benefit for my customer, mm, which is a wrong argument, but I hear that uh, many times. With open source software, everybody is embracing when you, when you find new bugs. Because when you find new bugs, uh, it means that the software gets better. They are happy to, to uh, be able to get your, your bug requests and so forth. Something else I was referring to before was creativity. So a combination of existing building blocks of open source software uh, provide new solutions that are unforeseeable for the original author. And what I mean with that is, for example, examples like that. Here, for example, you have beehives, which are made of trash bins. It's a creatively new reuse of the old thing. And here, for example, has anybody an idea what this might be? looks like a gun or a firearm. It's actually a film camera, which was made of parts of a firearm. One of the early film cameras looked like that. You can watch it, uh, see it in, in, in Paris. This, for example, is a creative reuse of a plastic bottle. It's a lamp. There's a light bulb in it, and it's working. <laughs> uh, yeah. And... At the end of these uh, slides, I want to take a quick look at the future from my personal point of view, because in my personal point of view, in the long run, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of decades, uh, each and every general purpose software will be open source software. Because the business model has that many advantages, because open source don't have to have new features every time, new package, new major release, and so forth. So they can concentrate on improving, not on providing something new, because people need to buy this as well. So in my opinion, closed source software in the far future will concentrate on uh, small markets, on uh, highly professional software for, I don't know, CAD or some calculations for certain companies and so forth. So in my opinion, this is, uh, this is the way to go for general purpose software. And how do I profit myself from my open source projects? All of my open source pro projects have in their readme. If you like this software, please do send me a postcard. And this is a postcard from Adrian from Melbourne. Hello, Adrian in Melbourne, uh, who sent me a software from the other side of the world because he liked my software. And this is something which motivates me to do more software, to improve his software he's using because I know that he is uh, very lucky to use the thing that also helps me. Okay, so free and open source software has some advantages for you. Uh, hopefully there were some other arguments which you haven't heard before. And uh, if you like to uh, follow me, uh, here's my homepage. I blog a lot. I blog about personal information management, open source software. I'm on Mastodon and I'm on Twitter. 
I hope you enjoyed the show. If there are any questions, please ask me uh, outside because uh, we are already late time-wise. Thank you. <laughs>